Hello and welcome back. So what I want to talk about today is quite a simple but quite an interesting circuit. That is the capacitance multiplier. Now it's not a very common circuit, you rarely see it in a commercial product, but it can have quite a lot of uses and it's been known for quite some time. I mean, I found it in my old books. So you can see it here in this old 1960s book on radio related circuits. So we have a transistor implementation and this is a very old symbol for the PNP transistor, but we also have it in a vacuum tube implementation. So basically you can build this thing with anything. So bipolar transistors, field effect transistors, vacuum tubes, you name it, it will most likely work. So what I want to do today is look into a bit more detail on how this circuit works and what are its limitations. So if you're curious, then keep watching. Now, to understand the capacitance multiplier, we need to understand its most common use case. Power line filtration. Now, in most modern day circuits, so with switching power supplies, if you want to filter the power line, you need to filter the switching frequency, which for most common circuits, it's anywhere between 50 kilohertz and 2 megahertz. And then you need to filter any sort of ripple or noise associated with the power supply that is of a much higher frequency. So everything up into the 100 megahertz range. And to make a good circuit to take care of this noise, you usually need a filter that has a corner frequency of about one decade lower than the noise that you're trying to filter. And with LC circuits, that's not quite difficult to achieve. Let's have a look into a simulation. So what I got here is a basic LC filter whose corner frequency I calculated to be of 5 kilohertz. And we can check this in the simulation and we see this nice spike going on at 5 kilohertz. Usually you can take care of this spike with some extra resistance but I didn't put it in the simulation just to keep things a bit more simple. But if we look at 5 times this frequency, so at 50 kilohertz, we can see that we have a nice minus 40, almost 40 decibel attenuation. So whatever noise you put into this at 50 kilohertz, your output will be a hundred times lower. So good filter. Now on the other hand, if you don't want to use switching power supplies, but rather supply your circuit from the mains through an iron core transformer and then rectifying it with a rectifying bridge, the frequency that you need to filter is no longer 50 kilohertz and above. It's rather hundred hertz or 120, depending on the region in which you live in. And filtering that low frequencies is a much, much tougher challenge, mainly because the components involved need to have very large values and large value components usually mean they're expensive. So with this previous example, 10 microhenry inductor and 100 microfarad capacitor, these are really easy to come by. Now, on the other hand, if we want to filter 10 Hertz, we need completely different components. So here I built a circuit with a 25 millihenry inductor and a 10,000 microfarad capacitor. And this has the corner frequency at exactly 10 Hertz. But depending on the voltage at which you need to get the circuit to work at, the 10,000 microfarad capacitor can be really difficult to obtain. And also depending on the current at which you're working at, a 25 millihenry inductor that doesn't saturate can again be very difficult to obtain. Now, another thing that you can do is instead of using an LC low pass filter, use an RC low pass filter. So something like this here again, I worked out that the corner frequency is 10 Hertz with a 3.3 ohm resistor and the 4,700 microfarad capacitor. And if we have a look, we can see that at 10 Hertz, we have a minus three decibel attenuation. So the math checks out, but you can see that at hundred Hertz, rather than having minus 40 decibels, we only have minus 20 decibels. And that is because this is a first order filter, whereas the LC circuit is a second order filter. Now to get the same attenuation at 100 Hertz, we can either push the corner frequency another decade lower, so make a filter that has a corner frequency of 1 Hertz, so something like this, I swapped the 3.3 ohm resistor with a 33 ohm resistor, and if we look at this circuit, and just compare it to the first one, so there's not that many things there, we see that at 100 Hertz, they both have the same attenuation. But afterwards, the inductor filter is much better. Or if we don't want to go on this route, we can create a second order RC filter. So something like this. 
basically it's two low pass filters one after the other. And for these values we have a second order attenuation with a corner frequency of 10 Hz and we can see that after a while both this and the LC filter, so the green line, both have exactly the same filtering properties. Now of course you don't have to go with these values, you could put 33 ohms and 470 microfarad capacitors and you would get the same effect. But there is a problem with this filter. Let's check it out in real life for a moment. So what I have here is a low pass filter built with a 22 ohm resistor and a 470 microfarad capacitor and I'm supplying this from my power amplifier which is getting a signal from the signal generator. Basically I'm supplying this with an 8 volt DC voltage that has superimposed onto it a 2 volt peak to peak 100 hertz sine wave. So the yellow line. And we can see that the output, the blue line, is filtered. Now this is not a very big attenuation since this is a first order filter and the corner frequency is not that far away from the signal that we're trying to filter. But what I wanted to show you was not its poor filtration capacity, but rather what happens when we start to draw any sort of current through this. So the output is not just connected to the oscilloscope, it's also connected to my active load through an amp meter. Now, as soon as I start to draw any sort of current, we see that the attenuation properties stay the same, so the AC component of the output has the same amplitude, but depending on the current we're drawing, there's a larger or smaller voltage drop on the filter. And this is mainly because of the current passing through the 22 ohm resistor. So the voltage drop on this sort of filter will be the current times the series resistor. So if I would want to pass one amp through this thing, through the 22 ohm resistor, I would have a voltage drop of 22 volts on it, which is huge. So ideally what you would want is, rather than using an LC filter with large inductors, use an RC filter where you can use resistors that are quite small in package, but have only a very small current passing through the filter and then have the power current passing through something else. So to keep the filter running at low currents, but have the high current somewhere else. Now, if only there was a way to amplify current, some sort of current amplifying device. Well, I guess there is. Let's try to see how we could build a circuit with this thing. So what we can start off with is looking at the common collector transistor amplifier, also known as the emitter follower. Now what makes this special is that the output voltage is only 0.6 volts lower than the input voltage, whatever that may be, basically because of the voltage drop on the base emitter junction, but the signal passing through the transistor doesn't really care about what's in the collector. So in this example I put a 90 Hz sine wave in the collector and a 50 Hz sine wave in the base and on the emitter side we can only see the 50 Hz sine wave. So whatever is in the collector doesn't influence the circuit. Now you can build this either with bipolar transistors or with field effect transistors. The difference in this case being that the output voltage will no longer be the gate voltage minus 0.7, it will be the gate voltage minus the threshold voltage, which for field effect transistors can get up into the range of a few volts. But if you don't really care about voltage drop then you can use field effect transistors also. Now the main reason why we're interested in this circuit is not any of the voltage drops, but rather the current amplification. So this is the exact same circuit as above, but this time I looked at the ratio between the emitter current and the base current, which in this case is around 180. So the current passing through the transistor through the emitter is 180 times larger than the current in the base. So you no longer need to have a filtered voltage at high currents because you're relying on the transistor to amplify this current. Now if you want more current gain, you can use Darlington type transistors. Either build them from individual transistors or buy the ready-made component with both of these in the same package. And by doing this, so the circuit on the left, if I take the emitter current and the base current, we see a gain of 40,000. Now in your real circuit, the gain might be higher or lower depending on the exact transistors and the parameters at which they are being used. But by doing this sort of circuit, you will only have to filter your input supply at a very low current and rely on the transistor to amplify the current. 
So basically we can swap our initial circuit, so the RC filter with 22 ohms and 470 microfarads, with this sort of circuit. I still kept the RC filter, but I changed the values. The corner frequency is still the same, but the capacitor, the biggest component, is much smaller this time. And I simply added the transistor. So here you can see the two circuits that I've built. Now, from a size point of view, granted, it does help that on one side I've used surface mount components and on the other side it's through holes, so the surface mount components will always be smaller. But even without taking that into consideration, I was able to go from electrolytic capacitors to ceramic capacitors because of the much smaller value, and I no longer need a power resistor to pass all the current through, I can simply put a tiny little low power resistor. All the power dissipation will now go on the transistor. And depending on how the board is designed, you will be able to use quite small components in small packages. Now if we run this thing and check out the two outputs, we see that the AC amplitude is exactly the same. So the filtering effect in both cases, which is dependent on the corner frequency of the RC circuit is the same. But with the circuit on the right side, I managed to get a slightly lower voltage drop. Now taking care of the values a bit, trying out a second order filter, maybe going to a Darlington type of transistor, you will be able to get the voltage drop under much more control and much smaller. But it highly depends on what exactly you're trying to do. But there's still an issue with this circuit. Let's check it out in real life, see exactly what that is. So I got the same setup as before. And what we can notice is that we have the same output ripple, so that didn't change. The output still varies with the current, although it's not as bad as before, so I can go up to more than 200 milliamps and I'm still getting a decent amount of voltage out of it. But the difference appears when we go to very small loads. So if I reduce the load current, at very small loads, the output ripple seems to become worse. And the issue here is the different way in which the capacitor multiplier works in comparison to the RC filter. So here I have a measurement with my first circuit. We can see that when the input voltage, the yellow one, is high, then the capacitor is storing this energy, so the charge in the capacitor is rising. Whereas when the input voltage is low, then the capacitor is discharging. So with this circuit, the capacitor is working as an energy storage device storing the excess energy and then releasing it when there's not enough. In contrast, here in the measurement of the capacitance multiplier, when there's no load, the output voltage always has to be smaller than the input voltage. Because this circuit doesn't rely on storing the excess energy, but rather dropping it on the transistor and turning it into heat. And that is why the output voltage always has to be smaller than the input. Now as long as your ripple is small, so roughly below a volt, this will not be obvious, but when you need to filter a very very large ripple, then this can become a problem. But you can solve it by adding an extra component. So what I did here was put a larger capacitor just to make things a bit more obvious, and we can see that when our input voltage drops, then so does the output. And the problem here is that the voltage reference, the voltage that is driving the transistor, is more than 0.6 volts higher than the supply voltage. So you cannot drive the base emitter junction while still keeping current going through the collector. So what you need to do here is take this reference voltage a bit lower and that way you can still drive the transistor. And to do that you simply add an extra resistor. By doing this we push our reference voltage a bit lower so the filtering action is the same, that didn't change, we just took it a bit lower. And this time, the output voltage is now a nice sine wave, and it's nicely filtered, and always smaller than the input supply. So in the end, the capacitance multiplier doesn't replace capacitors. It can help as a filter, but it will not replace the energy storage properties. And that's why it needs to be used with caution. Now, in the olden days, this circuit was not that common because adding an extra transistor or a vacuum tube was extremely expensive, so this was only done in special equipment, consumer devices didn't really have this sort of circuit, it was simply cheaper to add a big inductor, and when transistors became extremely cheap, 
this circuit was still not really commonly used because you had something even better, a proper voltage regulator. And the thing is that the capacitance multiplier works on the exact same principle. The only difference being that it only filters, it doesn't really regulate, so it doesn't give you a precise output voltage. But regardless, in certain applications it can still be really useful to this day. For example, in cases in which you don't have a proper voltage regulator, so when you work with very high voltages, commercial regulators are not really available or they're really expensive, or in case you don't want to stabilize the output voltage, so if you want it to vary with your input supply. Then this sort of circuit is just the thing that you need. You only need to be careful on how you choose the components, and you need to accept that there will always be a voltage drop on this circuit. So all in all, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos, and see you next time, bye bye.